Hello there. The 2010 remake of I Spit On Your Grave and the 2013 unrelated sequel, I Spit On Your Grave 2, had up until this point been their own self-contained stories, albeit remarkably similar stories, but they followed two completely different people unrelated to each other. And then 2015's I Spit On Your Grave 3, Vengeance Is Mine, comes along and breaks the cycle. The third entry is a continuation of the first movie, and it's going back to focus on Jennifer Hill and what her life has been like since the savage attack she survived. The first two movies followed an extremely formulaic approach. The main character gets established with a bit of backstory. We meet the antagonists before they do anything outright evil. The main character is then brutally and horrifically attacked, and then we finally get the payoff, with the prey now becoming the predator and enacting revenge. I Spit On Your Grave 3 doesn't follow the same formula. The underlying themes are all still intact, those being sexual assault and murders, but this time, it doesn't follow the exact same story beats as the previous entries. Jennifer Hill, now going by the name Angela, is trying her best to continue living her life despite the horrific events which happened to her. We see that she attends therapy sessions and her view of the world is now extremely dark and bleak. She suffers from flashbacks of her assault and is constantly reminded of what happened to her on a daily basis. After suffering the torture of near-constant flashbacks, Angela decides to go to a group for survivors of sexual assault. When attending these group sessions, she starts to make friends with an eccentric character named Marla. Angela and Marla start to become friends, and you the viewer realise their views aren't so different from each other. Marla comes across pretty headstrong with her views on enacting justice upon anyone who would do horrific things to women. And as we know from the first movie, Jennifer, now Angela, has indeed taken things into her own hands and dished out revenge upon her attackers. Naturally, they become friends, talk about doing things to people who commit these crimes, and then decide to follow a drunk man home from a bar after he admits to beating his wife. They pull his trousers down and scream in his face, resulting in him pissing himself in sheer terror. Now I'm not sure if this scene is supposed to be comical or not, but I sure as hell was laughing at it. We start seeing more and more often how Angela fantasizes about killing people who do her wrong. It seems to be a side effect of the events which happened to her in the first movie, and now she's constantly thinking about murdering people who may cause her any harm. And as this is an I Spit On Your Grave movie, there's bound to be plenty of murder coming up. Marla and Angela progress from scaring women beaters to outright bludgeoning people with crowbars and threatening their lives if they dare assault anyone again. That's what they do to the stepfather of a young girl who attends the group therapy sessions after finding out she lives with the man abusing her and her mother is doing absolutely nothing to stop it. Since the horrific events of the first film, Angela has quite understandably retreated into an emotional shell, not exactly getting along with other people and definitely not trusting other men. That's why it's so important for Angela to meet Marla, another like-minded woman who can relate to her past struggles while at the same time being a genuine friend to her. That's why these next events will serve as a catalyst for Angela to start spiraling out of control and murdering all over again. Marla is murdered by her abusive ex-boyfriend, and it's even hinted that she was sexually assaulted too. And with this being a movie about rapists being savagely murdered, of course he gets away with it. A police officer then visits the group therapy sessions and all but confirms it was the ex-boyfriend who did it. With the justice system failing Marla, Angela decides it's time for her to take justice into her own hands. Even though it's a different set of events, just like the first movie, a traumatic experience triggers Angela into committing several grisly premeditated murders. She catches the eye of the ex-boyfriend in a club, lures him to an alleyway, and after the movie doubly confirms he's a real piece of shit, with no hesitation, she savagely mutilates his genitals and then beats him to death. And that's it. She started. There's no going back from here. She once again has a taste for death, and now she started killing, she sure as hell isn't going to stop. She's like a fucked up vigilante Batman, except she chops people's peepees off and brutally murders them. The next target is the man from earlier, the man her and Marla confronted with a crowbar to the face. He started abusing his stepdaughter once again. That's all Angela needs to know. She once again lures this man into a secluded spot. 
this time into a dark abandoned warehouse. She proceeds to taser him in order to incapacitate him. She ties him to a chair, flips him over on his face and begins tormenting him. It's then she pulls out an extremely large metal pipe, applies lubricant to it and... Well, yeah, you know where this is going. The scene ends with him essentially being impaled by it after she uses a sledgehammer in order to cause as much inside damage as possible. Just like the first movie, she isn't going to make these deaths quick. They don't deserve quick. She wants to inflict pain and suffering onto them just like how they have to other people. She's going to slowly torment them just like they did to their victims, before slowly and painfully ending their existence. This is when she realises who her third victim is going to be. Angela starts to become close to a man at the group therapy sessions named Oscar. His daughter committed suicide after her rapist managed to get away with it scot-free. After hearing his story and how much the justice system has once again let a victim down, she decides it's going to be him. After stalking the man for several blocks and attempting an attack, this time things don't quite go the way she had hoped. He caught on to the fact that he was being followed and put up much more of a fight than she was expecting. She's about to be sexually assaulted and murdered by the man before the police show up and repeatedly shoot him in the chest. At this point, you as the viewer are probably thinking the jig is up for Angela. She's had some sort of connection to each of the murders and now this time she's been caught at the scene. Albeit almost as a victim of a murder, but things aren't looking good for her. Oscar shows up at the police station, slits his wrists and falsely confesses to all of the murders in order to save Angela. Although, the strange thing about these events is that it doesn't actually seem to have much bearing on the effects of the story. Angela gets released on bail, and at this point, she realises she's more than likely going down. She's angry and has obtained a taste for blood, so she decides to head out one more time in search of someone to kill. There's been this reoccurring character who's been harassing her on the street throughout the movie, and once he appears, she decides he's next. However, just like the previous attempt, Things once again don't go Angela's way. Right before she plunges the knife into this man's chest, she is shot by the cop who appeared earlier. And then the big twist of the movie, you realise all of the one-to-one -one therapy sessions the movie had been sprinkling in for bits of exposition actually took place after the events of the movie, in prison. You then find out she's about to be released after only serving two years, which makes you wonder what she actually ended up being charged for in the first place. Did Oscar take the rap for all of the other murders, and heard just the attempted murder that she was shot for? I'm not exactly sure, it's not explicitly stated. However, before the movie comes to an end, we realise all of these therapy sessions she's been attending haven't really had any sort of effect on her. She's still having fantasies about murdering people, and at this point, it's not just rapists and people who have wronged her. The 2010 movie was about a woman who was caught in a horrible situation who managed to survive her ordeal and put a stop to the men who did it to her. This movie is about that same woman who decides to take justice into her own hands once again and stop people from hurting others. However, she begins to spiral and starts to develop a bloodlust, and it becomes more about her enjoying it than anything. And with this movie's ending, it could be interpreted as her becoming a villain and not just a killer of people who deserve it. I do appreciate how this movie attempts to break the mould of essentially doing the exact same story like the first two entries in the series did, and it's managed to cut out seemingly pointless padding like the second movie had to focus on a more direct approach to storytelling. Because let's be honest, these movies are for people who want to watch horrible things happen to horrible people, and I Spit On Your Grave 3 exceeds at delivering that to the viewer. You still get your violent and well-deserved brutal kills, but this time around, the movie uses a different method of making you absolutely hate the characters. The first movies would have long, drawn-out, explicit assault scenes, which lingered for far too long and put you right in the face of the victim with extreme close-ups, trying to make you, the viewer, feel as absolutely uncomfortable as possible. But in this movie, you only hear about the horrific events, there's no more plastering it in your face to make you despise these villains. It shows less, but still manages to convey that these people are evil and they need to be dealt with. And that's fine, because what benefit would there be to be showing another explicit, drawn-out sexual assault scene? The only real message one could probably discern from this movie is that sexual assault is bad, 
and if you push someone far enough into a corner, eventually they're going to slap back. And that's fine. This is a nice bit on your grave movie. Give me some brutal, satisfying kills to some bad guys, and I'll be happy. That's all I really want out of one of these movies.